Just before we continue with today's video, a quick message from our sponsor today, Galaxy Lamps. Imagine this, your very own starry night in your own room. Enter the Galaxy Projector from Galaxy Lamps. The Galaxy Projector turns any space into a mesmerizing planetarium, showering it with vibrant countless stars. And guess what? Currently on sale. And it's got some neat tricks as well. Imagine controlling the colors, brightness, rotation, speed, all with a simple tap on your phone. You'll see some B-roll of me using one now with my kids at home. They absolutely loved it. Thanks to its user-friendly app, you customize every detail to match your mood. It's like having your own personal mood lighting designer. Plus, with the Galaxy Projector Rhythm, it dances to your music in its Music Sense mode. So swing by the Galaxy Lamp store and don't forget to use the discount code INTO THE SHADOWS for a fantastic 15% off your purchase. Go to the Galaxy Lamp store right now while it's still available at galaxylamps.co forward slash INTO THE SHADOWS code INTO THE SHADOWS. Thank you to Galaxy Lamps for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. The day started like any other. In the small suburb of Bramfontein, South Africa, home to the poor, mainly mine workers spending their days digging out gold, people rose from their beds, ate breakfast, if they had any, and went off to work. In the train yard of the Bramfontein station, not far from their front doors, ten trucks were waiting to be unloaded. The trucks had been sitting on the siding for three warm summer days. To the casual observer, it was just another train in just another station. However, at three o'clock that afternoon, an explosion would rock the city of Johannesburg as the 55 to 60 tons of dynamite filling the trucks exploded, an explosion that's still considered one of the biggest non-nuclear explosions in history. The explosion flattened the township around it, destroying between 1,500 and 3,000 homes. It was heard in Klerksdorp, 155 kilometers away, while some claim to have heard the explosion all the way in Bloemfontein and Rustenburg, at least 300 kilometers away. Stories did the rounds of windows rattling in Pretoria, 50 kilometers away from the aftershock shock of the blast. The official death toll only came to 75, however most historians agree that this is wildly inaccurate. It's possible that twice or even three times that many people perished that day. Despite the magnitude of this catastrophe, very few South Africans know about the Bramfontein explosion that happened on the 19th of February 1896. So what led to one of the most disastrous explosions in the country's history? Well, back in 1896, Johannesburg was far from the economic powerhouse that it is today. In 1884, the first gold was discovered, leading to the establishment of a small mining camp. Then in 1886, the main reef that kicked off the Witwatersand Gold Rush was discovered on the farm Langlater, and by 1887, the fledgling town of Johannesburg had a population of 3,000, and the city grew rapidly. Ten years later, by 1896, the census counted over 100,000 people living in Johannesburg. However, this rapid growth meant that there was no such thing as proper city planning. Large parts of the city were still more of a mining camp rather than a mining town, and there was no hint of the grand city that it would one day become. The homes of the ordinary workers were timber and corrugated iron construction. A few of the more sturdy homes had locally made baked clay brick walls, but the majority of the homes were little more than the cottages and shacks of poor miners. Newer, permanent businesses and hotels for the rich were being built in the town, but on the outskirts, around the railway lines and the station, the poor built their shacks wherever they could find some space. Of course, where you have mining operations, you also have dynamite. By 1887, German businessman Eduard Lippert had been granted exclusive rights to sell explosives by the government, and he established a company which imported explosives from Europe. The dynamite was delivered to the dynamite factory, built in Lufontaine, east of Pretoria, where the dynamite was shaped into cartridges before being packed up and shipped to Johannesburg by rail. Dynamite arrived at Bramfontein Station, destined for the mines with regular occurrence. There was nothing out of the ordinary about the way the dynamite arrived, but a series of misunderstandings and negligence led to a preventable tragedy. The dynamite arrived on Sunday evening, the 16th of February, 1896. The train trucks with the dynamite were left on a siding at the Bramfontein Station overnight to be dealt with in the morning. The siding is the short track next to the main track where trucks and carriages are left when they're not being used. The dynamite was the product of the dynamite company and, according to reports, wasn't regular dynamite but blasting gelatin, which is supposedly one of the safest explosives to transport as it needs a detonator in order to explode, which just raises more questions about how the disaster occurred in the first place. On Monday morning, the railway order service got an order from the chief of the railway company barracks to unload the dynamite and deliver it to the magazines of Edward Lippert. Standard operating procedure for the magazines was to accept dynamite 
out on a Monday morning at around 9.45 a.m., with an average of 1,600 cases delivered during the day, with the remainder arriving on Tuesday. Lunch was from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and work would resume at 2.45 and continue until 5 o'clock. At night, the magazines were locked, and the keys were kept safe in the order services office. Five wagons, under a loadmaster known as Clem, arrived at the station at 9.35, but the laborers needed to unload the dynamite only arrived at 10 a.m., so work started a little later than usual. At 11.30 a.m., Clem returned to the order services offices and uh, reported that there was no one at the magazine to receive the five wagon loads of dynamite. He was told to return to the magazine and wait for someone who could receive the cargo. He left, but at one o'clock, he was back again, stating that there was still no one around to take the explosives. By then, he'd already taken the explosives back to the train trucks and reloaded the dynamite without an official from the railway company present. On Tuesday, another request was sent for the wagons to collect and deliver the dynamite. However, no wagons were sent because of the trivial matter of three pounds. By this time, the dynamite had spent an entire day sitting in the hot sun of a South African summer, and according to reports, it was a particularly hot February. The dynamite had also been offloaded into wagons and then reloaded onto the train trucks, and according to some reports, those doing the loading and unloading weren't particularly careful, simply tossing boxes of explosives onto the wagon like they were unloading watermelons. The previous afternoon, after Clem returned to report that he couldn't deliver the dynamite, the director of the railway order services, Edward Jacobs, stopped by the administration of the railway barracks to find out who was to be responsible for the paying of this failed dynamite delivery. After all, the order services had done their job as ordered, but no one had been on the other side to accept the delivery. Someone had to pay for the interruption. Money was spent and needed to be reimbursed. He was told that the person responsible for receiving the shipment would be the party liable for paying for the interruption. Since the dynamite had to be delivered to Lippert's magazine, Jacobs decided that Lippert was the responsible party, so on Tuesday morning, he arrived at Lippert's office to sort out this whole mess. Instead of speaking to Lippert, he was directed to the magazine caretaker, William Langley. Langley, however, had no intention of paying, as he claimed no service had been rendered in the first place. According to Langley, he and the assistant caretaker of the magazine had waited from 10 a.m. until midday on Monday the 17th, but no dynamite arrived. They went off to have lunch and returned to the magazine at 2.20, but there were still no wagons and no dynamite. They waited until 5 o'clock before returning to the office. Jacobs insisted that the wagons had been sent at 9 a.m., but Langley insisted that they never arrived. So Jacobs, clearly a man with enough work and no interest in arguing with a caretaker, informed Langley that Lippert would have to deal with the railway company himself, but no more wagons would be sent until the matter was finally resolved. After Jacobs left the office, Arthur Rutherford, the senior magazine caretaker, was informed of the situation. He ordered Langley to phone the order service, reorder the dynamite delivery, and then go to the magazine and wait for the delivery. Apparently, the order service agreed to send the wagons, but no dynamite arrived, seeing as Jacobs clearly stated that no more wagons would be sent before the matter of the three pounds had been settled. That was to be expected. Now, looking back, it's clear that someone was being less than truthful. Langley was the chief caretaker of the magazine at that stage, since the chief caretaker was down with typhus fever. On the other hand, Langley said he was there. On the other, Clem, with presumably the drivers of five wagons backing him up, claims that he wasn't. It can be argued that both men were at fault. Langley wasn't where he was supposed to be, and Clem, who probably had more work than just one dynamite delivery, was too impatient and didn't wait long enough at the magazine for someone to arrive before he returned the dynamite to the train truck. The fact that Clem also simply repacked the dynamite himself without the presence of a railway official shows that everyone involved, both the railway order service and the office of Lippert, had been negligent. By now, two days had passed, and the dynamite was still sitting in open-top trucks, barely covered with a flimsy sail under a blazing hot sun. By Wednesday, the matter of who would be paying the three pounds was still unresolved. After some undoubtedly colourful back and forth between a clerk at the railway company's barracks who threatened to send the dynamite back to Praetoria, and the office of Edward Lippart, who reported that they didn't care what happened to the dynamite, a poor choice of words in hindsight, an official at the railway company settled the dispute by agreeing that the railway company would cover the three pounds in question. Once this matter was settled, the order to send the dynamite to Lippert's magazine was reissued. So finally, as the hand on the clock crept closer to three, Clem and his men returned to the siding facility to finally unload the dynamite that had been sitting in the sun for almost three days. The question of the three pounds had finally been settled. However, no one could foresee the disaster the three-day delay would lead to. How unstable the dynamite would have been after three days of sitting in the sun seems to be up for debate. Some experts claim that blasting gelatin wouldn't have been affected by the heat and would still have been perfectly stable and safe to transport, while others disagree. If the unloading and delivery had occurred without incident, it would have just been another bureaucratic delay. Unfortunately, it's a train yard, and accidents happen. In this case, 
a shunting accident. While Clem and his workers were busy unloading the dynamite a second time, Jacob Bloom, a locomotive driver for the railway company, set about as a run-of-the-mill task of shunting 31 empty train trucks onto one of the three sidings at Bramfontein Station. Shunting is where a locomotive is used to push or pull trucks or carriages onto a siding. This isn't a particularly dangerous operation. In fact, it had been Bloom's main occupation in the three years that he worked at the railway company. Assisting Bloom in his task were two shunters, Hendrik Vermeulen and Joseph Williams, the foreman shunter, Sidney Oxer, and his stoker, Matthias Pienaar. Of the three sidings, one contained the trucks of dynamite and another truck loaded with coal. The 31 empty trucks had to be shunted from the goods shed onto the left siding, the only empty siding available. Being the shunter foreman and the man with the most experience in this sort of thing, Sidney Oxer was the man in charge. Oxer made two contradicting statements, which is a tad bit concerning. He claimed to be very proficient at shunting, however, he also admitted to not always following the rules. Whether this played any role in the tragedy, we'll never know. One of his duties was making sure the railway turnout or switch was in the right position. The switch changes the track so that a locomotive can move from one track to another and is used to steer the train onto any of the three sidings at the station. Oxer sent the two shunters, Williams and Vermeulen, to check on the switch and positioned himself near the front of the trucks, which was standard procedure. The locomotive would be pushing the trucks onto the siding from behind instead of pulling, so a lookout near the front was necessary. Both Williams and Vermeulen insisted that the switch was in the right position when they left at 2.30 p.m. to prepare the trucks for the shunting operation. Both men noted a worker cleaning the switch or working near it, though neither really paid any attention to the man. Bloom, the locomotive driver, also claimed to have seen the worker, but he didn't pay any attention to the switch. He felt that it wasn't his job and therefore not his responsibility. Finally, everything was ready for the shunting to begin. Next to the station was the Rand Timberco mill, and the train track curved slightly around the mill's shed. There was also a large pile of timber. Both the bent and the pile of timber obscured the line of sight of the men on the locomotive, so they fully relied on their lookouts. Williams was on the fourth truck as the locomotive started pushing the trucks, going slowly only at about two miles an hour, 3.2 kilometers an hour, despite the normal speed being four to six miles an hour. This was because of a slight downward slope around the mill, leading the drivers to use just a little extra caution. Just after the train crossed the switch, there was a shout and a signal from Williams to stop. The locomotive and its brakes were in Good condition, but no one on board heard the shout or saw them signal to telling them to hit the brakes. Bloom, the driver, initially couldn't see the switch, but when he saw it, he realized it was in the wrong position. Instead of taking the train onto the empty siding, the train was on the same siding as the trucks of dynamite. The stoker immediately applied the brake, but the locomotive was in motion down a slight slope, with the weight of 31 empty trucks adding to its momentum, so there was no way of stopping it. Now, the exact sequence of events is a little unclear from here. The explosion definitely followed the collision. However, whether it was immediate or only after a few seconds or even a few minutes is up for debate. The shunting crew, who miraculously survived the blast, claimed that they probably hit the dynamite trucks, but they couldn't be 100% sure about it. Some of them were certain they never felt the collision. One member of the crew even claimed that the explosion went off before the trucks collided. However, it's more likely that the explosion was instantaneous and he simply didn't feel the shock of the collision. Perhaps they hoped that another explanation for the explosion could be found and the fact that they were just on the wrong siding was a coincidence. However, all witnesses that could be found, and there weren't many left after the blast, seemed to agree that the explosion followed the collision. The odds of the dynamite exploding due to some flaw in the explosives mere seconds before being hit by 31 train trucks coming down a slight hill is extremely low. In defense of the crew, they had just survived a devastating explosion, and the shock in that moment would make it nearly impossible for anyone to calmly take note of the facts for a later inquiry. The man who was seen cleaning the switch, or working close to it, never came forward. It appears he might have been on the moving train as an extra lookout during the shunting operation, but he was probably killed by the blast. Clem and the other workers unloading the dynamite would have been right at the epicenter of the explosion and were probably killed instantly. The question of the switch is an important little detail, and a question that has never been answered. Both Williams and Vermeulen insisted that the switch was in the right position when they checked it. Oxer stated that he sent the two shunters to inspect the switch, but never checked it himself. All of them mentioned a worker cleaning or working around the switch, and there is the implication that this unknown man, who could never defend himself because he most likely died, changed the setting either on purpose or by accident while cleaning it. Oxer also insisted that from where Williams was positioned on the train, he should have been able to see the switch when he gave the signal for the operation to get underway. However, Williams did try to stop the train, but no one heard him. Did he only realize the switch was in the wrong position after giving the signal for the operation to start? 
Some historians suggest negligence on the part of the crew, but with no one able to really explain what happened that day, we'll never know whether it was incompetence, negligence, or just the worst possible luck at the worst possible time. The resulting explosion left a crater around 76 meters long, 18 meters wide, and around 15 meters deep. A Johannesburg correspondent for the Cape Times described the scene where the trucks of dynamite stood as nothing more than a gaping hole reminiscent of the Kimberley Diamond Mine, also known as the Big Hole. Arthur Headley Chilvers, who was 17 at the time of the explosion and later became the mining editor for the Rand Daily Mail, described the explosion as a vast black and gold cloud rising like a colossal mushroom into the blue. The debris raining down on those alive to see it was a mix of body parts, both human and animal, and twisted iron scraps. The houses around the station and those in Bramfontein got hit the hardest, and the location set aside for indigenous workers of Asian descent today, the suburb of Newtown, was wiped off the map. Half the suburb of Fordsburg had been destroyed. According to reports, every window in the center of Johannesburg had been blown out. While the explosion caused a lot of injuries and deaths, many more people were injured or killed by their homes and businesses simply collapsing around them and on top of them. Initially, the fatalities were estimated to be around 75 people, and the monument erected in Bramfontein Cemetery in memory of of those who died states that 75 people lost their lives that day. However, this is probably not the case. Many historians believe that up to 130, if not more, people died, with over 300 injured and thousands left homeless. According to The Star, a work gang of 100 convicts found 78 bodies and collected four boxes of unidentifiable remains, while another unverifiable source claimed that 20 coffins filled with random body parts were buried somewhere in Bramfontein Cemetery. Many people simply vanished. They couldn't be counted among the dead because there wasn't anything left to count. The majority of the victims were Poor, the ones who built their homes on whatever land they could find next to the railway. With the explosion happening in the afternoon when the men were at work, those who died were mostly women and children. There were more injured than the local hospitals could manage, and so the Wanderers' sports grounds were used as an infirmary and field hospital, while the site at the agricultural show was used to house the thousands left homeless by the disaster. It was reported that President Paul Kruger wept at the sight of the dead children. International dignitaries, among them Queen Victoria, sent condolences, and a relief fund was set up to provide food and shelter. The fund immediately raised £60,000 and quickly grew to 130000 According to one source, it was used to serve around 89,000 meals and later used to rebuild homes destroyed by the blast. In a disaster of this magnitude, even back in 1896, there was an immediate outcry to find someone to be held responsible for the loss of life that resulted. So, once the worst of the disaster was dealt with, an investigation into the cause of the explosion was launched. The first party publicly on trial was the railway company. The accident happened on their property, and those in charge of the shunting operation were railway company employees. The railway commissioner came under fire, and many critics claimed the only reason he got the job was because he knew absolutely nothing about the workings of the railway. Harsh, but that's South African politics for you. Even President Paul Kruger's anger at this disaster was initially aimed at the railway company. Oxer and Williams were also pointing the finger at each other. Oxer insisted that Williams had been sent to check the switch and claimed that it was in the right position, while Williams felt that, as the foreman shunter, it was Oxer's responsibility to double-check that the switch was correct and secured. Oxer also claimed that he had told Williams to be near the front of the train to act as a lookout, and Williams was not where he was supposed to be. If Williams had taken the position assigned to him, he would have seen the problem on time. It's worth noting here that, according to reports, Oxer was close to the front of the train, so he was possibly in an even better position to see the switch, but it appears that this point was never raised during the inquiry. However, the shunting crew were not the only employees under fire. During the investigation, the director of the dynamite factory at Fontaine explained how dynamite should be handled when being loaded and unloaded. While he didn't go into detail, it appears that he thought that not enough care had been taken by those offloading and reloading and offloading the dynamite from the train. It came to light that many of the workers handling the dynamite had never been trained in how to safely handle explosives. Eyewitnesses claimed that the cases of dynamite were sometimes thrown from the train onto the wagons. Unfortunately, the men handling the explosives, and therefore the best witnesses to what actually happened, had all died in the explosion. Regardless, it's up to an employer to make sure their employees are trained to properly handle dangerous materials, so it appears that there was some negligence on the part of the railway company. The investigation also learns that the detonators for the dynamite had been on board the same train. While the proximity of the detonators to the explosives probably didn't cause the accident, it was nevertheless strictly against the rules. Clem reloaded the dynamite onto the train on Monday after the failed delivery without a railroad company agent present. Is it possible that he mixed the dynamite with the detonators in his haste to get the job done? As for the dynamite, samples of the blasting gelatin that were removed from the trucks before the explosion were tested by a Scottish engineer and two South African chemists and all agreed that the explosive was of high quality and in good condition. The blame for the explosion could, therefore, not be ascribed to a flaw in the explosives. 
The Commission of Inquiry finally concluded that it was impossible to determine the direct cause for the explosion. There were simply too many factors that could have played a part in the disaster. The explosives had been left in the sun with minimal protection for three days. The explosives had been handled incorrectly. And then there was the shunting accident because the switch had been in the wrong position. It was a combination of factors that just produced the worst possible outcome. And despite the enormity of the explosion, very little is known about it, and its exact cause is considered a mystery still. Even the exact location has been lost to history. We know the explosion happened at the Bramfontein Station, as it was in 1896, but other than a single monument, in the Bramfontein Cemetery, there's no indication of where exactly the epicenter of the explosion was. In fact, very few South Africans are even aware of the disaster. I wish it was possible to name those who died, but sadly, we'll never know who they were. They were the poor, the unimportant. And thanks to segregation laws that were already in place in Johannesburg at the time, the deaths of the indigenous population were most likely completely overlooked and probably not recorded anywhere. Today, Johannesburg is a metropolitan powerhouse with a population of 6 million, and it's the biggest and most prosperous city in the country. However, it's easy to forget that this wealth was built on the backs of the thousands of poor miners of every race who died digging up gold that drove the South African economy. There were many disasters in the years that followed, but this disaster, the children that died that afternoon in 1896 while playing in the streets, enjoying the warm African summer, should not be forgotten.